Well, hello there. This is Cliff Searcy, and it's time again for another episode of Music and the Word with the Searcy's. And we're continuing with our Life of Christ series, and we're now on episode number five. We're going to be talking about Jesus as a boy. Jesus when he was a boy. Now, the scriptures don't tell us an awful lot about what happened when Jesus was a boy, but there are some things that it does tell us, and I'll tell you why. It's pretty interesting. There is a lot of information that we can gather from just the very few short verses that tell us about Jesus' childhood, okay? So we'll be studying that today. Here's a song that talks about the crucified life. We recorded this about a dozen years ago, and uh, it's a song that I hope you enjoy. It talks about how we're crucified with Christ. the price I chose to pay And to think I ignored what really mattered Cause I thought the sacrifice would be too great When I finally reached the point of giving in I found the cross was calling even then And even though it took dying to survive I've never felt so much alive For I am crucified with Christ And yet I live Not I, but Christ who lives within me his cross will never ask for more than I can give. For it's not my strength but His, there's no greater sacrifice. For I am crucified with Christ, and yet I live. As I hear the Savior call for daily dying I will bow beneath the weight of Calvary Let my hand surrender to His piercing purpose That holds me to the cross yet sets me free I will glory in the power of the cross The things I thought were gain I count as loss And with the suffering I identify And by His resurrection power Strength, but here. 
Here's a song from our brand new album. It'll be out in another few weeks. And uh, it's the title song. And it talks about how our Lord is so worthy. Hear the cries of the shackled from the onset of time from the chains of their defeat there's no key see the tears of those that are broken Hear the cries of those enslaved Is there no one worthy to set us free? Then that crying is made still And a chorus rings out And all the shackled are then released From their chains And thousands of voices are swelled Worthy, worthy the Lord. 
hope you enjoyed our music. We have a new album that's just uh, being released in the next few weeks, and uh, the finishing touches are just being put on it, and we're already starting to play uh, some of the songs from that album, and we'll have them on the broadcast, and I hope, hope you're enjoying them, okay? Well, we're continuing our study of the life of Jesus. This is episode number five, and we're going to be talking today about Jesus as a boy. Very, very little is written in the scriptures about Jesus until he's 12 years old, and we'll deal with that today, and then we don't have any other sight of him or any other information about him until he's 30 years old, okay? And we'll be dealing with that in the next few weeks. In our last broadcast, we talked about the trip to Egypt that they took, and remember that Joseph was warned in a dream that they needed to leave and leave right away because Jesus' life was in danger. Now, they were in the Bethlehem area, the wise men had just come and visited him. And you'll recall that Herod had told the wise men, when you find the child, let me know where he is because, uh, wink, wink, I want to come and worship him too. Well, that was not what Herod wanted to do at all. We know that. But in any event, so they were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. So they went back to their countries by a different route. And it took a little while for Herod to figure out that he had been swindled by them and outwitted by them. And so he had asked them about what time did the star appear. And so based on the time it was at that point and the time they told him that the star appeared, he figured it's been about two years. And so he had a decree put forth that all the children in the Bethlehem area that were two years old and under that were males were put to death. And uh, we told you last week that was about 35 to 40 children. What a horrible horrible monster Herod was. You remember some of the things that we've told you in prior broadcasts? There were 70 people on the Sanhedrin. That was the council, the ruling council. And part of Herod's job being appointed by the Roman emperor was to keep order and to keep things really going good in Israel to kind of manage it. He, he kind of presided like more of a mayor than a king. He was appointed. He was not a descendant of David. He was not even Jewish. He was a Arabic in, in nationality. And so having been appointed to keep the peace and to keep things on an even keel, we, we know that Herod uh, had some trouble from some of the real uh, patriots there of the Israeli people. And so he had 64 of the 70 council people of the council, the Sanhedrin, he had 64 of them assassinated so he could replace them with his puppet people, okay? It's a bad guy. He's a real bad guy. It's funny that they call him Herod the Great because of the Herods talking about his sons that followed him. He was the most prominent. That's why they call him Herod the Great. was not anything great about him, okay? And so this terrible, terrible thing happens to the people that are in the Bethlehem area when they lose their children because of the evil works of this king. And it was just after the wise men left, I mean just after they left, according to scripture, that Joseph was warned in a dream to go to Egypt and to flee with the child and, and with his mother. And of course, we told you last week that the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh very, very costly, very, very valuable commodities that you could trade for just about anything you needed were given to them, and they left right away. It says they left in the middle of the night. And so we understand that for the two years that they were in Egypt, God, with that gift, evidently financed them. Jewish people found a hard time to work in Egypt. The Egyptians didn't like to deal with the Jews. And so even though he was a tradesman, he was a carpenter, he may not have gotten a lot of work. But in any event, we do know that he did have the funding because of that gift by the wise men. See how God timed that? Oh, aren't you glad that God times things like that for you in your life? How incredible is that? The wise men did not show up until the very, very time they needed to go on that trip and the finances were provided for them. Well, how wonderful that is, okay? In Matthew chapter 2, we read that after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. He said, get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So Herod was the one that was all concerned about there being a king of the Jews because he wanted his sons to follow him. And uh, there was just a, a, a fear that uh, he had that there was going to be some other king that was born that was going to come and take away his dynasty. Okay? 
So he gets up, Joseph does, takes the child and his mother and goes to the land of Israel, according to verse 21. But then he hears that Archelaus, the son of Herod, was reigning in place of his father, and he was afraid to go there. But again, being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, the area up north by the Sea of Galilee, and that's where they came from, okay? And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth, so that fulfilled scripture because it was said through the prophets that the Messiah would be called a Nazarene. And of course, he came then from Nazareth. Well, the scriptures said that he was going to be born in Bethlehem, and of course, that's what Micah the prophet had prophesied. And of course, that came to be true because of the census that forced them to go there to register there in Bethlehem. And the scripture says, out of Egypt have I called my son. And so how interesting that he winds up in Egypt as well and comes back from Egypt. And then you get the idea that that's a real, real far, far, far journey. But, you know, if you look at the map and you see where Jerusalem is, and you see that where Egypt is, just only several days journey, you can get there pretty easy. And so in any event, there's just a little trip to the southwest and you're in Egypt. And I don't know how far into Egypt they went. But Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus were able to get to Egypt in probably just a matter of several days. So we know nothing else of Jesus until he's 12 years old, and we see him as a boy in the temple in Jerusalem. Now see, it says in Luke chapter 2, verse 41, that every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover, and they would go every year. I suspect that many of those years, if not most of them, that Elizabeth and Zechariah would come down from the hill country and probably travel with them. Of course, they were the parents of John the Baptist. And so they would travel as a family. Of course, that being Mary's cousin, a bunch of families would get together and travel in a caravan when they would go down to Jerusalem for the feasts. The feasts were their holidays, and those were the times that they went down to Jerusalem to especially worship the Lord at various times and for various different events. And the Passover was the major event that they would go down, but every year they would make that trip. So probably John the Baptist was on a lot of those trips with young Jesus as they made their way. Well, every year his parents, it says, went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. In Luke chapter 2, verse 41, And when Jesus was 12 years old, he went up to the feast according to the custom. And after the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, and they were unaware of it. You see, they traveled in a caravan. I don't think there's very many people listening to me that haven't seen Home Alone. And they all saw that in the first movie. Kevin was bypassed, and in all the hustle and bustle of going to get to the airport on time, in the confusion, he was left behind. Well, then we see the second movie, and we see that the same thing happened again. In the airport, there was a confusion, and there was a mistaken identity, and as a result, he went one way, the family went someplace else, when you've got a lot of people traveling and a lot of commotion, there's just a lot of things that can get by you, okay? One of the worst things you can do is to lose your son, okay? And don't be too hard on the people in the movie Home Alone because Mary and Joseph did it too. But you see, they were traveling as families. There was all kinds of family and relatives and neighbors and all these people were traveling in a caravan and they assumed that Jesus was with his friends and with the rest of them in the caravan because... They didn't walk mother and father and son, you know, in, in, in formation. You know, they were just a part of the company. And Jesus, they thought, would make sure that when they left, he would be with them. But Jesus felt he had some other work to do. And so he stayed behind in Jerusalem, willfully, evidently. And uh, so they traveled on for a full day. Then they start looking for him among their relatives and friends. Anybody see Jesus? Anybody see Jesus? Where's Jesus? And they couldn't find him. Imagine the panic. Imagine the absolute panic that they must have had at that point. So they went back to Jerusalem, so they already went a day's journey. Now they go another day's journey to find him. In Jerusalem, they look around for three solid days. Oh, think of that. Put yourself in their shoes. They have been entrusted to raise the Messiah, the Christ the Son of God. God trusted them to cause him to be raised properly. They were his caretakers, and they haven't seen him for five days. They travel a whole day without having him in their company. They travel a day back and spend three days scouring Jerusalem. 
looking for Jesus. Anybody see Jesus as a 12-year-old boy? This is what he looks like. Anybody see him? Can you imagine how discouraged they would have been after three days? And they might have thought, oh, are we in trouble? Is God going to be angry with us? And they probably cried out to God and said, God, he's your son. Tell us where he is. And they looked and they looked and they looked and couldn't find him. But after three days, they found him in the temple courts. He was sitting among the teachers. He was listening to them. And he was asking them questions. And everybody who heard Jesus was amazed at his understandings and his answers. He was asking the questions that a 12-year-old boy would not have the understanding to be able to ask of these, of these uh, experts, these teachers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so badly? Why would you do this to us? Why did you treat us like this? We've been looking all over for you. And Jesus gives an answer that, in another context, someone might say, might think it was a smart aleck answer, but he was very, very serious. He said, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that I was going to be in my father's house? Didn't you know this was the first place you probably should have looked for me? And they did not understand what he was saying to them. But then he went down to Nazareth with them, and he was obedient to them. It says in the King James Version, he was subject to them. Kind of interesting. God had put him under the authority and under the leadership of his mother and his earthly father. And he didn't go and, and just say, don't you know who I am? Don't you know that I don't have to listen to you? Don't you know that I created the worlds? Don't you know who I am? I don't have to listen to you. He didn't have that kind of attitude. We're going to talk about that next week, the kind of attitude that he had. In fact, I don't want to shock you. At this point, even though the scriptures tell us that he was involved in the creation of everything and that nothing was created without his hand being involved in it. Now, don't you let me shock you here. And you come back next week and let me document this to you from scripture. In fact, I will partially in just a moment. It's even possible that he didn't even know and have the understanding and remembrance at that point that it was he with his father and the Holy Spirit that had created our world. Yeah, and I'll tell you why. And you think that can't be possible. Yeah, it is. And scripture explains that to us in an incredible way. You say, well, you're minimizing Jesus. No, actually, when you find out what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks, we're not minimizing him. We're speaking of his greatness. We're talking about how wonderful and how great he was. He's going to get bigger in your eyes in the days ahead in our study. So he went down to Nazareth with them. He was obedient to them, but his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Now, verse 52 is a verse of scripture that very often people just look right past. They just ignore it. But it is amazing what that scripture tells us. It says, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. The only thing that we have to talk about what happened between age 12 and age 30 when he reappears again in the public scene, the only thing we have is this verse that he grew in wisdom and stature. Well, he grew in stature. Everybody knows what that means. It means that he got taller. He got. He became the difference between a young boy uh, in adolescence at 12 years old and grew up into a 30-year-old man. Well, we understand that. Okay, we, we, we get that. But he grew in wisdom. Look at that verse very carefully. Jesus grew in wisdom. He was the Son of God. We're going to talk about it next week. John chapter 1 tells us, All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. It says that he was God and in the beginning with God. And yet, it tells us that he grew in wisdom. If you know everything there is to know, how in the world did you grow in wisdom? How do you get smarter when you already know everything? See, there was a progressive learning experience that Jesus was going through as he came into the understanding of who he was. Now you say, well, how are you, are you saying that he forgot? Are you saying he had amnesia? No, no, no. We're going to deal with it next week. This next week, the scriptures we're going to go to are going to explain exactly 
why young Jesus did not fully understand who he was or remember all of that which he knew. There's a reason for it. There's a good reason for it. And it actually is because of his own decision to not know. And we'll talk about that next week. I hope you come back and I hope you're with us. I hope you'll enjoy it, okay? When we come back. Hey, let me pray for you today. I don't know what kind of need you're facing. I don't know if you have a financial need today, a physical need. I don't know if you have a situation with your job or your family or whatever, but I know that God's concerned about that. And let's go talk to him about that. Lord, the one that is listening to me right now, I pray that you'll just meet their every need. I don't know what that need is, but you do. They're reaching out to you right now, Lord, and they're saying, Lord, you know my need. You know my situation. You know that I need desperately an answer from you and a provision from you. And I pray that you'll meet that need for them right now, Lord. We pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Next week, you'll be back here at the same place, same time. And we're going to talk about how Jesus willfully limited himself before he came to earth so that he could fulfill the mission that he came for, okay? And we'll do that next week on Music and the Word with the Circes.